Um, we are so glad to have you here. My name is Andrea Source. This is Chris Kelly. We are co-chairs of the Solano County chapter of the ACLU, which is an all-volunteer chapter designed to bring awareness um, and make progress on civil liberties issues in Solano County. And we are thrilled to be introducing you today to some of the staff of the ACLU of Northern California. Um, we're gonna help educate us about our issues. We're gonna talk about policing and kind of how they can support us in our police reform efforts. I'm gonna pass it off to my co-chair, Chris, for some more remarks. Thank you, Andrea. First of all, I want to say thank you all for coming. Thank you, and especially thank you for the families who have the courage to show up here today. Uh, this has been a long time in the making. Uh, it's going on close to three years. Uh, myself being an impacted family member who has been impacted by police violence in Vallejo, I am very happy that we have uh, finally made it to this point. So I just want to say thank you all for coming and uh, for our families and uh, friends and loved ones. You know, this has been a really hard bat battle. Um, just trying to get people to see the injustice that has went on in the city of Vallejo. For me, I've been fighting this fight for September 2nd, will make 11 years uh, since my brother was murdered by the Vallejo Police Department. His name was Mario Romero. So at that time, and for many years following that, there was absolutely no support to the families uh, who were impacted. In fact, we were treated like criminals, and um, on top of losing our loved ones, we were subjected to horrible, horrible things um, and losses that you know I can't begin to get into. Um, but there, you know, there is a record of it. So I just want to say, this is not easy to do. You know, you lose your you lose your loved one, and instead of having the chance to mourn, you have to immediately go into a fight to try to get justice. It's a, a place I never imagined I would ever be standing. Um, but I'm very grateful that I'm still standing because there are a lot of family members who are not standing here because they, they can no longer stand here. Um, and with all of our lost family members who have been taken, stolen from us, you know, we'll never give up the fight. And this just goes to show that if we had given up last year or the year before or the year before that, you know, we wouldn't be here, you know. Um, but we are also very grateful for all the community members who come and support us. Because when your family is torn apart, you know, you guys can't always help each other in the ways that you would have done previously. Because so many unknowns go on with the loss. So I just want to thank you guys all again for coming. And um, we're very excited for this presentation uh, from the ACLU. Thank you. Um, 
and the long list of people that this police department have, has murdered and continues to create more and more victims of their violence. Uh, as you will hear from all of us and as most of you have, you know, will share with us later, many of us have uh, you know, experienced police violence in its various forms in this country. We're deeply aware that the institution of policing in this country and in this city is no different than all cities in this state and in this country is deeply racist, right? Uh, and that police departments across the board have visited untold violence across many communities uh, throughout this country, throughout this city, throughout this state. What we are here to do today is to listen to all the concerns that you have. We may not be able to work on all the areas that you, know, you, you will raise today, but there will be areas that we will be able to work on. Um, so, you know, as a, as a matter of like figuring out the big picture, we want to figure out the full list of things that you're concerned about, you want us to look into, and after that, we're going to want to know more about what are your areas of priorities, what are the things that are causing the most harm uh, in a broad way. And then from there, we'll figure out amongst ourselves what are the different ways that the ACLU can be of best service. We have attorneys, we have organizers, we have policy advocates uh, who are eager and willing to figure out different ways we can be helpful uh, to all of you and to this community here. Um, and that's what we're here to do. Uh, we hope that we can come out of this meeting with you know, our marching orders so that we can come back to you and say, these are the things we can concretely do and these are the ways we can be of assistance and the areas um, that you're concerned about that we may not be able to do something about. Either we will stagger it so that we can do it later or we'll figure out ways other people can do it so that we're kind of working to figure out, uh, to advance the solutions. Um, so that's why we're here today. Um, I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves and then later we'll go into some of the work that we've been doing in the city and then uh, have the majority of the time open for us to hear from all of you. Does that sound good? Right now. <coughs> Hi everyone, my name is Avi Fry. I'm an attorney. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here. I'm thrilled by the turnout. Um, thank you to Andrew and Chris for putting this together. Uh, it's obvious that there's a lot of passion for reform here. Um, some of you I know, many I don't. Um, we've been around sort of in some capacity for a little while and doing things here and there. I think part of the purpose of us being here tonight is to show you uh, we're going to make a sustained push in Vallejo. We're going to commit resources um, in an ongoing way to make an impact and to, and to be around. Um, and so for those of you who I don't know, I hope I do get to know, um, and I hope we're able to establish a relationship as we go on. But thank you for taking this first step with us and, and showing up tonight. said and thank you so much for coming out tonight we know that everyone has busy lives and that you're making time to be here so thank you and again thank you to Andrea and Chris for helping to organize this event my name is Emmy Young I am also a staff attorney with the ACLU criminal justice program and like Avi said you know we have some ongoing things that we've been working on here oh volume up thanks but we are also really interested in learning what more we can be doing and what more we can do to support the community here. So thank you again, and we're looking forward to speaking with you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marshall Barnwine. I am our legal policy advocate, and I'm based out of our Sacramento office, and I have been recently assigned to advance policy issues here in Vallejo, so I'll be working uh, with you all closely. I look forward to meeting you all. I left my business cards in the back um, near the pizza. Feel free to grab one on your way out um, just so that we can stay in contact and figure out how we can uh, move along justice for this community. I probably should have this better. I have to go set up my presentation. I should have went first, but uh, give me one moment and then we're going to jump into um, the presentation today. Uh, my role is to implement state legislation 
into local jurisdictions like Vallejo across the county. So that's my primary role is to make sure that the lobbying that we do on the state level is actually implemented properly on the local level. So you'll be hearing about Senate Bill 2 uh, police decertification in just one moment. Well, Marshall sets up um, his presentation. I'll just walk us through what, uh, what we have planned for this evening. So we'll have a presentation about Senate Bill 2, about officer decertification that Marshall is going to present on. Then we have uh, a case ongoing litigation matter about the badge bending that uh, Avi and Emmy are pleading. So they will brief us about what's the latest on that and what's going on. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the civilian review over, uh, overview Oversight Board, and then we'll talk also about uh, what things can we do in the political space in terms of police departments have their budget set, right? The city council, the mayor has a role to play, so there's some discussions we'll have in terms of what can be done in that you know, uh, political spectrum. And afterwards, we'll open up the floor for all of you to share with us what are the areas that you think we should be focusing on and we should be working on. Uh, ready? Uh, not sure, but thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? All in the back? Okay. I have 20 minutes, so I'm being mindful of my time here. Um, the reason I have my information up here to begin with is because this law is very complex. I'm not going to be able to break down every nuance of the law in the 20 minutes. So if you don't want to grab my business partner way out, feel free to take a picture of my information so that after this meeting, if you have any questions or anything that I shared today or something that didn't make sense, I'm more than happy to be with you over the phone, Zoom, whatever questions you have so that we can make sure you have a proper understanding of how this law works and how you can use it um, to advance justice in Solano County. So, Kenneth Ross Jr. Police Decertification Act is also known as Senate Bill 2. And before I dive deep into my presentation today, I want to acknowledge that this is not something fun for me to do. Um, all of my work is about advancing police practices when loved ones get killed. And so I want to acknowledge all the trauma, all the hurt that goes into making these laws a lot of impacted family members put in a lot of work to make sure that their loved ones never get forgotten. So I want to make sure I highlighted um, Kenneth Ross Jr., um, who the bill was named after. Um, I'm going to talk more about him in just one moment. Whenever I do these presentations, I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due. This was a wide range of support that we had a couple of years ago, trying to pass this through the California State Legislature. We had Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. We have ACLU of California Action, Anti-Police Terror Project, Black Lives Matter California, California Families United for Justice, Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice, Policy Link, Stop Coalition, and Youth Justice Coalition. So these were a wide range of sponsors that came together, along with many other impacted family members that helped guide us through this process. And without these organizations and impacted family members, this bill would not have been possible. So I would like to um, give credit where credit is due. So the why. Why is this bill named after Kenneth Ross Jr.? Kenneth Ross Jr. was a beloved son, father, brother, and friend. He was only 25 years old when his life was stolen by the Gardena Police Department in April 2018. The reason that this law is so important is because the officer that killed Kenneth Ross Jr. had previously shot at least three other people and worked for a police department in Orange County before transferring to the police department where he worked at. 
And this law was established in 2021, and it creates a statewide system to decertify police officers. Decertification is simply just making sure the officer no longer has their badge. And we see this in other professions. Whether you're an attorney, you can get sued for malpractice or get your license removed from the state bar. Or if you're a doctor, you get sued for malpractice, you could lose your license. So now we have a police um, decertification process where an officer can lose their badge and not be able to just bounce around to different police departments. And if there's any questions that arise um, during this time, please make sure you don't forget it. I would like to address it um, when we get to that portion of today so that I'll be able to um, address it appropriately. So what you see here is the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training. You may hear me refer to POST throughout this presentation. And this, these are the members of POST. In the SB2 law, it allowed POST to be the system that decertifies these bad actors. So that's why it's important for me to flag who POST is, because these individuals um, have authority within the decertification process. So what is POST responsible for? They set the minimum standards for the selection and training of California law enforcement. They create the licensing scheme for law enforcement officers called the proof of eligibility. And they oversee the SB2 decertification process, including publishing the names of any peace officer whose certification is suspended or revoked and the basis for that suspension or revocation. I want to talk more about when these public meetings are. They happen about four times a calendar year uh, within Sacramento, Los Angeles, and different regions where you can attend and watch to learn how the decertification process is going to play out. So now that you know who POST is, POST is going to have to use this guideline for reasons in order to decertify a bad actor. So I want to go over these nine definitions with you. Something to keep in mind that's extremely important is that the only way for an officer to lose their license is if post show that serious misconduct has occurred. So if the complaint from a community member falls outside of these nine definitions of serious misconduct, that will not be a way to decertify a policy. So I need to make sure I set that into context for perspective as we go through each of these. Now, some of these have really long definitions, and if it does, I'm not going to read it all the way through. I'll make sure if you leave your email with me or grab my card and you email me and say you want my presentation, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. So dishonesty. Dishonesty is defined as relating to the reporting, investigation, or prosecution of a crime, or relating to the reporting of or investigation of misconduct by a peace officer or a custodial officer. Here are some examples. It's not limited to these, but false statements, intentionally filing false reports, tampering with, falsifying, destroying, or concealing evidence, perjury, tampering with data recorded by a body worn camera or other recording device for purposes of concealing misconduct. So it's not just lying in general. So for example, if an officer is going to the scene of a crime and that officer was drinking Starbucks and in the investigation he decided to say I was drinking Phil's coffee. Yes, he lied about what he was doing on the way to the investigation, but that specific lie does not count as dishonesty for 
this certification purposes. It has to fall under these specific definitions. And a recent example a few years ago that I want to share with you on what dishonesty could be is that there was an officer in the San Bernardino Police Department that sent an email to another officer and they lied about what happened during their investigation. And lying about an investigation, that will fall more into the dishonesty category to get decertified. Abuse of power. Abuse of power includes intimidating witnesses, knowingly obtaining a false confession, or knowingly making a false arrest. So I looked up another example of abuse of power, and there is an officer in a police department where this male is the lieutenant of a police department, and he has a female officer that's lower in rank than he is. And she filed a sexual harassment claim against the lieutenant who's over her in the department. And she was, a claim, she was claiming that because based on his power and position, he used that to intimidate her sexually. So that could be an example of abuse of power, using your ranking over someone to um, intimidate them. Does all this make sense so far? Yep. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Physical abuse. This one is a small definition. It includes what's not limited to the excessive or unreasonable use of force. Um, unfortunately, we all know or probably heard of Rodney King. That's who is the individual right there. Um, terrible situation that happened. Happens all the time. We see it in the news. We see it here, here in Vallejo, Vallejo, California. Any type of excessive and unreasonable use of force will count as uh, definition. So this is a long one. I think we all know what sexual assault is, but I don't want to make an assumption, so I'll read a little bit of it. It's the commission or attempted initiation of a sexual act with a member of the public or members of any law enforcement agency by means of force, threat, coercion, extortion, offer of leniency, or other official favor, or under the color of authority. I found another example uh, for this. Right now, there's a San Jose police officer who was facing the certification because when he went to a call for service, for whatever reason, I'm still unclear why, when he was there at the call of service, he ended up exposing himself um, to the family at the call of service. And that, that would be an example of falling into sexual assault. Demonstrating bias. This is defined as inconsistent with the peace officer's obligation to carry out their duties in a fair and unbiased manner. Bias could be on the basis of an actual or perceived race, national origin, religion, gender identity or expression, housing status, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, or other protected status in violation of law or department policy. Um, by show of hands, have you heard of the racist text messaging scandal that's been transpiring in Antioch? So that would be an example of demonstrating bias. Um, there's also in Torrance, California, the police department there, there's a lot of officers that's currently on the decertification list uh, for racist text messages that they've been texting to each other uh, about people of color. So acts that violate the law, these are sufficiently egregious, extremely bad, or repeated as to be inconsistent with a peace officer's obligation to uphold the law or respect the rights of members of the public. So this one was more just a, a catch-all, 
so that in the event that an officer does not fall within the other definitions that we just talked about, that there's no wiggle room. Like, if you ended up doing something that violated the law, that too will be a cause for decertification. And the example that I was able to find was, there's an officer right now that the decertification list for this act that violated the law because this individual was charged with willfully and unlawfully having fentanyl in that person's possession. So that is the act that violates the law that can get you on the decertification list. Participation in a law enforcement game. A group of peace officers within a law enforcement agency who may identify themselves by name and may be associated with an identifying symbol, including but not limited to matching tattoos, and who engage in a pattern of on-duty behavior that intentionally violates the law or fundamental principles of professional policing. I'm not going to go through all those, but I can say for certain, but potentially, badge bending can be something that falls under this particular game. Also in Los Angeles, there's current investigations for um, a group called the Executioners um, through the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And right now they're trying to see, they're trying to prove legally that they were a game as well within the Sheriff's Department. Third, to cooperate with an investigation. This is when there's an investigation happening and uh, there's potential misconduct and you're not cooperating. Um, whether it's they're asking you about where your location was or they're asking you um, to just simply comply with the process of the investigation and you do something that goes contrary to the normal proceedings. And we're coming up on our last one. Failure to intercede. Failure to intercede is when you're present and observing another officer using a force that is clearly beyond that which is necessary as determined by an objectively reasonable officer under the circumstances, taking into account the possibility that other officers may have additional information regarding the threat posed by a subject. And for all those that may have unfortunately watched or um, read the news when George Floyd got killed by Derek Chauvin, the other officers that were just watching the killing proceed, that could fall into the definition of failure to intercede. <clears throat> so I know that was a mouthful, but basically, remember who POST is. POST is the agency that puts people on the decertification list. Then POST has to find out did that officer fall within these nine definitions that we just discussed today? Okay, this is where it gets a little complicated. There is an actual due process hearing that has to happen after POST figures out which officer needs to be placed on the list. So the law says that if a police department gets a complaint from a citizen or just within their files about an officer falling within those nine definitions, within 10 days of that complaint, they have to automatically send that investigation to post. So that's what SB2 created. Within 10 days of receiving the complaint, whether it's from a community member, whether it's from within the police department, they have 10 days to send that complaint to post. Now what's important is post does not review that complaint until the local agency finishes the investigation. So that of course could take some time. And we're also depending on that local agency to follow the 10 day rule to affirmatively send that documentation over to post. But that's something we could talk about at a different day where we as community members could get involved to make sure that 
Vallejo Police Department is following SB2 and sending all of those complaints over the post. All right, I'm going to try to figure out how to do this in a minute and a half. <laughs> Can everyone see this? Can you see this in the back? Okay. Now, I really, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk it out loud, too. So at the top it says, post initiates the certification review. Are there grounds for further review? The ground that they need is those nine definitions that we went over. So I think we all understand that part. By show of hands, we understand that first part? Excellent. So if yes, then we move on in the due process. If they don't fall in that nine category, then our officer decertification process ends and there's no decertification to officer. So let's move down to where it says post investigates and determines whether there are our reasonable grounds for your certification. So this is the part where Post has hired actual investigators specifically to review what the local agency has sent to Post. So there's several bureaus across California that do thorough investigations of each local agency's work to make sure that this officer fell in line within these nine serious misconduct definitions. If yes, then it goes on to the third box that says advisory board reviews and decides whether to recommend the certification. So the law created this new advisory board and it consists of nine members. The governor appoints some members, someone within the Senate appoints some members, and this is an important piece for community members to know because you all could apply to these positions. And that would be super helpful to get community involvement uh, within this process. So I wanted to make sure I point that out. And if you're more interested on how to apply to those, we could talk after. Uh, for this initiation process, five has already been appointed. So there's four positions left. I'm not sure where they are in that process, but it doesn't hurt to apply. All right, that was my time, so I'm about to wrap up. So after the advisory board, which is made up of civilians, they review what Post just reviewed. So it's just another checks and balances. So local police department does their investigation. They send it to Post. And then the advisory board gets to review as well. They take a vote. And if they say yes, it moves back to the full Post Commission. The full post commission were those 18 individuals that was on the left-hand side at the beginning of this presentation. And then that full post commission makes a vote and decides whether to adopt the recommendation of the advisory board. Because the advisory board could recommend decertification, they could recommend suspension, or they could recommend nothing at all. So after the full post commission votes, let's say they vote yes. Then there's an actual hearing before an administrative law judge. And this is where the officer brings their attorney and then Post also has an attorney to defend why this officer should be decertified. So the first one through four boxes is not an actual court hearing, it's more just a preliminary finding. But toward the bottom is an actual court hearing before a neutral administrative law judge to decide if the decertification was warranted. And if so, they get decertified. You see on the right hand side. If not, no decertification. I couldn't fit it on this list, but the officer can also still appeal that ruling as well to the Superior Court. So it's a very lengthy process. Um, but I at least want you all to be aware of the process so that when we talk more about it, um, whether there's another meeting to go more into detail. Uh, but I'm going to wrap up here, pass over to my colleagues, and see who is next. Can we ask a question? Marshall, you should keep a little more time. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Well, give me the wrap up cue if, I, if it's going too long. Okay. Uh, someone said they want to ask a question. I do. 
Um, does POST and the advisory board have full access to everything, including personnel files and stuff like that? That's an excellent question. So there is a fight right now about that. I bet. <laughs> and it's a lengthy response. And just make sure Does I get your- Does it involve police unions? <laughs> oh, do you want to, can you repeat your question? No, I'll repeat it out loud. Here. Oh, we have a mic. Oh. I asked what access post and the advisory board has to information that they need, including like personnel records and all that stuff. Yeah, so POST has the information that they need to conduct the proper um, investigation. The interesting part is that information is not likely to be made public. That's the part that's not helpful. And I see we're going to have a bunch of questions. I humbly submit, can we answer them during that 50 minute time period? You, we not, can you write your question down so you don't forget it? Yeah. I want to make sure we get everyone's question answered within that Q&A part. Is that okay? Okay, because I don't want to take the rest of my colleagues' time. That was the only reason. Okay. I know we had a couple of questions. And we got Mike. From the local agency or Assuming that the officer is not working during this process, is that correct? Yeah. Is he able to work in the community while he's under decertification process? He's not supposed to, or he or she's not supposed to. They're supposed to be under uh, temporary suspension. And the list is public, public knowledge on post page of every officer that is temporarily suspended. So they're not supposed to be working, no. First of all, thank you for acknowledging the organizations that you work with. Um, my question is, and it might be silly, but where does our do nothing district attorney fit in this who will not prosecute nobody? The question of where does the district attorney fit in this process? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a really good question. So from my understanding of SB2, the DA doesn't have direct involvement in this process. But I have to look at double check. But from my understanding, it's mainly the police department that has the affirmative duty to send that investigation to post to get the, the process started. But that's a great question. I will double check on that. But I believe the bulk of the accountability is with the local agencies. Are we good? 
it on time? Or yeah, we're good. Uh, the mic's coming around, so. Oh, I know, yeah, we have people in front too, so. Oh, yeah, it's coming. Okay. We can do it. Can you hear me now? I am trying to speak closer. Oh, yeah. yeah, the question that I have is, is you have a police department that's involved in badge bending. Do you want to trust them to open up an investigation <laughs> to themselves, or is that what we, we trying to do? And they're not supposed to be at work, and what we're dealing with is officers who can go off the clock and go kill witnesses and family members and people who are speaking out. And we sitting here talking about uh, this is the best that we can do. You know, we tried to get this is the only time that they offer us. It shouldn't be a statute of limitations on murder. It's never been a statute of limitations on murder. So why should police officers uh, be above the law? Which they are. I hear, definitely hear you. Um, we shouldn't be backing down. We should be stepping up. I think yeah. Can you repeat your question at the beginning? I just wanted to know where we were we supposed to depend on the investigation to start at the police department uh, to investigate themselves, basically, because we're saying, well, we're giving them 10 days to start up an investigation, and if they don't, then what? So what, do we rely on a police report that we know that bad vendors like any bad police reports that don't make no sense? In essence, who is gonna be responsible for making sure that these protocols are enforced and are followed by the police departments. Because that, that's one of the biggest issues in Vallejo is that there are been procedures in place and protocols and laws and rules, but when the city officials themselves, when the district attorney all refuse to follow the laws and the protocols and these new bills that have been passed, who is there to enforce that and see to it that they're complying with the law that you're saying? No, that's an excellent question. So there's a number of us that, so the ACLU, we're to offer resources and making sure that particular agencies are affirmatively sending those uh, investigations to the proper post. Um, in theory, the post, they got a lot of money to get investigators, to get attorneys through this process. Um, a lot of the co-sponsors that you saw mentioned, uh, I work closely with them on this implementation process. How were your co-sponsors selected? Yeah. Uh, Why don't they all have impacted family members on? Yes. Uh, well, just, like, my question is, how were your co-sponsors selected? Because I noticed a couple of your co-sponsors have questionable reputations within the impacted family community. I don't know if you guys did your full research on who you wanted to co-sponsor with, but you know there are two for sure that made me kind of um, get a sour taste in my mouth when I saw them up there on the board. Well, I don't know who you're referring to, but I would like to figure out what you're talking about. Well, no, we're not putting nobody on. Yeah, no, not right now. I mean, like on the side of it. Uh, I would like to like learn more of what, you know, potentially cause harm, if I'm unaware of it. Um, as far as choosing co-sponsors, I'm not aware of that either. Uh, that happens at the state levels. Um, as the affiliate, we work on the implementation process after it gets passed on the state level law. Because I'm an impacted family member, but at the same time, I don't care what side of the fence you stand on, everybody gets better. And if you took time to bet, all of your co-sponsors, you would find that there was at least two of them up there that have, I say, at least questionable um, tactics for why they're in this fight. And questionable, um, there could be questions asked what they've done with money that they received in the names of our dead loved ones. And to see them up on the board, um, it's a little disconcerting. No, absolutely. And I definitely want to connect with you and be open to it so I can learn more about it. I don't have any uh, information on what you showed me is new. Um, so I would love to tap in with you after exchange information so we can figure out um, a way forward if you're open to it. I have uh, one question. I'm over here. <laughs> I have uh, one question. How are the post 
uh, people chosen? Are they all officers? Or have, are they all police in the police force? Or are there civilians on the post uh, commission. commission? Yeah. So I could have did a better job explaining. Because it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, the police t taking care of police, policing police. And that sounds kind of. Yeah, so I mean, I can't, I can't really read all those, but I, I, I really, I mean, I see somebody with a badge on there, so I'm assuming he is a officer. But what about the rest of them? Have they been in the uh, police? Have they been officers or so sheriffs or what have you? Yeah. So on this particular picture, most of them are sheriffs or some type of law enforcement. So, officer, and there's only like one or two public members on this commission. How do you get a, how do you get a fair a fair shake if you got police policing police? It's like they do here in Vallejo. The police are policing the police. Nothing gets done except for they get their way, and we get nothing. We get the shaft. I mean, we we had a uh, city council that voted. No drug testing for police, for police officers. Where in the heck? I, I don't know if there's other police places that do that, but we certainly do. And they, we should have let them. We should have let them walk out. We should have let them go on strike. We wouldn't be in this position probably now. I, I just want to say that the anger in this community isn't directed at you, good folks, right? No, we know that you're here trying to help. We just know from, I mean, they just ran off the, the first black police chief sending him racist, uh, racist death threat. Like, they, we're in a different situation where decertification is maybe not what, you know, going forward. We have a going backwards problem where we have, you know, white supremacists, open racists, people that have called people in the, among each other they're racist, right? Where they're calling black police officers boy, things that we all understand to be racist. And we have a lot of those people that this law won't, won't fix. And so I think a lot of our, our frustration will be, you know, we know that, that these, these folks aren't gonna decertify the people we're, we're concerned about, who are sergeants, their captains, their lieutenants. The entire command staff, the recruiting team has been filled with, with murders and white supremacists for a long time. So I think this community needs more conversation about what we can do about some of those issues rather than the decertification which is a many years process um, because you know we got you know what five six impacted families here whose loved ones were murdered some of them lynched I mean actual racist terror and things that have happened and so if this can't go backwards to capture these these people, I think we need to, we want to focus from, at least from the, the families and, and from the community, is what can the ACLU do to support getting rid of some of those systems that are in place that, that the decertification won't, like I said, but we do appreciate, um, you know, you guys coming in and even giving the attention to the layout that nobody has had, but I, I think that the mic will just go around with a lot of frustration of going, hey, what about this, the, you know, the lieutenant that shot six people who's still here? What about, you know, people who've beaten people to death and got promotions? And, you know, so I just wanted to mention that it's not our frustration isn't at you guys. We're not angry. We appreciate and want you guys here, but we have, we need to figure out what the support is on some of those issues that, that can't be, can't be touched by the decertification. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good segue to transition this meeting to actually hear what it is that you would like us to focus on, what are the problems we can be most helpful with. So why don't we transition to that portion of this meeting. So because SB2, as everyone's noting, it does a certain thing, there are also things that it does not do, and there are real pains that you're all, you're all mentioning that it does not answer, right? So to the question of we're trying to save lives, what are the issues you want us to really look at? What are the solutions that you've been working on that you would like our support on? Why don't we turn that conversation to, to that so we can hear from everyone and kind of figure out what are the, in what ways can we be most helpful? So I'm seeing hands, I'm gonna need help with the mic. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, 
again, I want to thank you for being here, and I hear everyone's concerns. I attended Vallejo Police Department's first town hall meeting uh, on August 8th. Uh, a lot of people, there's going to be another one September 7th. I encourage people to show up, people voice their concerns about policing here in Vallejo. One thing I want to point out, I think this is the system that you're describing, I think might help. Uh, you're hearing some feedback that maybe there could be some adjustments to how the post folks are, are selected. I want to make sure that whatever solutions we discussed, we need to also factor in that here in Vallejo, crime is ridiculous. People are reporting cars being stolen every day, businesses are being stolen or uh, burglarized, uh, insurance companies won't cover these businesses after multiple. And so my question is, I want to make sure that whatever discussion or solutions, because I think that's what you're asking us to share, right? Solutions based considers these issues where we have a shortage of police, yeah. and I've heard there's a part of the reason that could be a corrupt department yep. driving the good ones out. Yep. That's what someone said at the last town hall meeting. I don't know if that's true. I've only moved here, it's been less than a year, so I don't know all the issues. If that is true, you need to connect that with getting us good police officers who are gonna protect us as well and drive the bad ones out. So I just want to make sure that we keep that in mind. Thank you. Mike's going to circle around. We're just going to be mostly listening and taking notes, and if there are specific things to respond to, uh, we'll respond. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to ask, uh, what happened to, there was some sort of system, AI system, that looked at all the calls uh, for the officers and <coughs> used an AI to to pick out things that were over policing or or aggressive policing or instances of, of where body cameras aren't turned on. And my other, uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, apparently there was funding for that, this, the, 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 the new police chief after uh, the old police chief got booted out of town by the Police Officers Association. They, they had this system that would that would scan for for police abuse, and um, and they funded it, and then they took the funding away when the new police officer came in, when the new uh, chief of police came in. So I'm wondering what's going to be happening with that funding for that uh, AI system to look at police abuse through the the cameras. And my other question concerning the police cameras: Does that fall under the the not the the one of the nine things you could do to, is not turning on your body cam. If you have a camera and don't turn it on, is that under the, the heading of, of tampering with evidence and is that grounds for a post review? Thank you. Thank you. Could I, could I answer that question? Yeah. So after the... So to the second question around if they don't turn on their body camera as a part of the misconduct, we'll double check and circle back with like a specific answer for that because it's a specific, specific situation. Hi, so my name is Philip. I was previously on the surveillance advisory board. Um, and so to answer that question, the previous chief did, there's, so you have body cameras, right? Uh, but what they also had in addition to that is um, auditing of those body cameras. And that's, and that's what in question. So yes, the, exactly. the budgeting wasn't removed on that. They chose to move into a different direction and not go with that company to continue that auditing, which is controversial in itself considering the history of the Vallejo Police Department. So it, it wasn't a budgeting issue. That was a decision that the city and the police department decided to move on from. Yeah, it, because they would be called into account if, if the review happened. Correct. It, so it's, it's correct. more significant than that. The company so. reached out to me personally. So I've never unsolicited. They sent me emails and they said, we found concerning behavior from Vallejo Police Department. We brought it to the chief's attention. This is approximately the time they're pushing him out with threats. At that time, they, when the chief was out, the same week that they fired the chief's recruiters who were trying to bring non-racists into the department, they also fired them and said they're going in a different direction. So when we found the misconduct and concerning behavior, we decided that we that the 
that, to get rid of the chief who was looking for it and to cancel it. I feel, I, I feel free that anybody can get those um, screenshots for me. I pr produced them to the Department of Justice. They're part of litigation now. They reached out to me because they were so concerned that when those issues were raised, I mean, to have a company reach out to a civil rights attorney because of their concerns of what's happening at the police department, when that could potentially affect, affect their business, it was very, very disturbing. So we found misconduct and we intentionally turned a blind eye to it. So that's, um, I feel free to you know, share that information with people. It's, you know, I've, I've distributed that pretty, pretty broadly so people would know. And like I said, unsolicited, they reached out to me to make sure we understood what was going on. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> very specific I'm question. Gonna, okay. We're gonna come back to answering questions. I just wanted to take a second because our chapter heads have said that we, apologies, we're feeling our way. We want to do a couple of different things here. We want to hear from you all, but we also want to let you know what services we can provide now that we are making an effort to be here in a sustained way. So maybe it would be helpful for us to offer some of the things that we think are possible without a promise that we'll achieve results and without being able to say we'll do it all, but to let y'all know these are the things that people do in other places and that we are capable of doing to try and reform this police department, to change the culture within the police department. Okay, and we know it's, it's not about rooting out bad apples, it's about changing the culture wholesale. I mean, there's no trust or confidence in this police department and that's gonna take a minute, but there are things that can be done, okay? SB2 is one thing. I also want to say, I think everyone in the room knows Melissa, suing the shit out of them is another thing. Yeah. Money down the yeah. line. Yeah, we get to pay for that. We get to pay for the murderers. I was, I was, I was trying to say, that money. I was trying to say, I have tremendous respect for the courage that Melissa shows in, in showing up every day and suing these people. Money's fine, but it's not everything. So let's so let's move in. Let's move into. So here's some stuff. What is your reform going to do? You said that you have resources. Are the resources going to the police department? Or are they going to the are going to the uh, citizen protection program? Because some of these people are being terrorized by police for standing here tonight. So the, here's some of the stuff. That we have. One of the things is you may have heard about a consent decree. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's been going on for several years now is the Department of Justice has been working with the police department on a voluntary basis to try and institute reforms. Okay, you may be familiar with the fact that the OIR group did an investigation, they made a number of recommendations. Okay, those have not been implemented in a timely way. They were supposed to be implemented. That's correct. A couple of months ago. And then this, did you hear, did you read about this report? I'm not sure what you're holding up. The Vallejo Transformative Initiative, which is the cop's answer to the 70 blah blah recommendations that the OIR made, he stood up in city council and went through this list, which is a bunch of basically BS. And then it all went away. Nothing's happening. Well, so the, the next step that you may have heard is that the Depart California Department of Justice said, well, we didn't get it done in the three years we were working with them voluntarily. We'll get it all taken care of under a consent decree, which was news to us, as I imagine it was to other folks in this room. First of all, what's a consent decree? Okay, a consent decree is a settlement that happens in this type of case between the government on the one hand at the state level, the Department of Justice. It can also happen at the federal level, but in this case we're talking about the State Department of Justice. They reach an agreement after bringing a lawsuit against the Vallejo Police Department. Typically what it would be is they bring a lawsuit saying, you're violating people's civil rights. And then what happens is the Vallejo Police Department immediately throws up their hands and says, we agree, let's agree to get, let's come together on terms for what's called a consent decree. And that will lay out what then they are bound to do. It's no longer voluntary. Now it's before a judge. It's signed by the judge. And so what you get in a consent decree is, you get a, a list of things that they are then required to do, and if they don't do them, you can bring them back to court, and if they still don't do it, you can, they can be held in contempt. That's all I beg. You're begging for them to do the right thing, and here's the thing. We are in a dissent decree, right? You gotta get all of these things done, and if they don't do them, then you come back again, and all of that, we've been through all of that. It makes I, no, I, it, listen, it makes no sense if we can't, you just said we can't go back five years, so what we're talking about is, we'll be real good from right now, and so, because people are watching us right now, but everything that we did before, 
we get a pass on that. That don't work because my, my little cousin was slaughtered in his car. So it don't work that way. Okay, well, we're laying out what the options are. If the consent decree is not something you want they us to work on. It seems like they're controlling the options, the police. So, well, so let me just finish the thought. Okay. Here's the view. Right now, we are not involved in discussions with the California Department of Justice. Uh, there have been some folks in the community who are talking to the California Department of Justice. We could get involved in a more concerted way and lay out what we think would be meaningful or have the best chance of achieving some kind of reform uh, in this police department. I don't want to say, I don't want to be misunderstood to say, this will solve the problems or bring justice to everyone who's been negatively impacted. It will not, okay? This is an incomplete solution. But it's not totally ineffective. Consent decrees do have some impact and they can change the culture over time. That's just what I'm gonna say about the consent decree and then I wanna move on to something else because I'm, I'm trying to lay out what the options are. Y'all are aware y'all fought for an advisory board. The Citizens Complaint Review Board, okay? It's a three-part system. It's a big deal that this got passed in Vallejo. I'm not saying it solves all the problems, and I've seen much stronger ordinances passed other places. But what, what exists as of now is a system in which you can make a complaint and somebody other than the cops investigate it, okay? Taking the review away from the police themselves, putting it in the hands of civilians, members of the community, okay? There are some things that could be much stronger about the ordinance that was created. For example, their findings are not binding, okay? They, they can only make recommendations as to what, what should be done as a result of the investigations. They can't insist on discipline, okay? Now, there's still value to it. I don't want to say that there's not. There's a lot of value in a civilian complaint review board saying. What's the what, point then? The, the point is for them to say what happened here was wrong, and that's public. We know that, though. Well, the yeah. difference is, the difference is, it has a different political force in theory. Now, there's a couple of things. One is the board's not up and running, OK? so. Assistance is needed to make it to even realize what was passed in December. That's the first thing. The second thing, which we could work on, and we've discussed in the past with some folks, is is it possible that a stronger ordinance could be passed in Vallejo, one that would make recommendations uh, not merely suggested but binding? In other words, to take the power away from the folks who have it now and suggest that civilians decide whether or not. You know, there has been uh, misconduct by a cop and what the discipline should be in that circumstance. If it's not binding, it's just bullshit. It doesn't mean anything. What's the point I don't wanna, is what I'm trying to, I, I don't I'm very understand. sympathetic to that, that point of view. I don't want to take anything away from the effort folks have made to create what exists right now, but I want to say it's possible to envision something stronger, and in that circumstance, there's a question, which folks may be aware of if you've been to some of the meetings, as to whether or not it's possible to pass a stronger ordinance under the existing charter, or whether the charter needs to be reformed. And if the charter needs to be reformed, that's a big political effort, and that's also something that we could invest our resources in, if that's what the community is interested in, okay? okay. That's something else that I want to talk about. The last thing I wanted to talk about, which we're gonna do regardless. If you like it, if you don't like it, we're already doing it, we're in it. We're suing to try and get the Giordano report out there about the badge bending investigation. Yeah. About okay? The I'm not gonna the pretend badge. I'm not gonna pretend this is this is gonna I'm not gonna pretend this is gonna solve Vallejo's problems. Okay. I, I I'm sure y'all have heard the same thing that I've heard, which is the whispers in the wind that, that the Giordano report didn't get it right. Okay. But we are suing to try and make that public so that we can make clear, make transparent that there was no justice in what the Vallejo Police Department did in response to badgement. So this is just a first step. But I, also, but, I, but I also want to pass, I want to bring up my colleague for a second, if you don't mind, just to share a little bit about um, what's been happening in the course of the Vallejo badge bending litigation, just so you can hear what we've been up to already. And at that point, if y'all think it's a good idea, we'll pass the mic back. Those are the things that we can think of. We want to hear from you what we should be doing. 
what we've talked about that sounds good, what sounds bad. We really want to do some listening, but I heard from our chapter meetings that we weren't making clear what our option, what the options for the community were, so I just wanted to throw out there the things that we have thought about and areas that we think that we could make some impact. But let me just quickly pass to my colleague, I mean, if you want to add a few thoughts about yeah. I, I, we don't need to. I have a suggestion. Why don't you sue the, the city of Vallejo attorneys that approved destroying evidence in ongoing That's a good one. Yeah. civil litigation? And it came out in the news. Did you hear about that? Yes, we're familiar with that. Okay. Because why don't you sue them? And why because is she still, why is she still employed? He, they're still employed, and we get to pay the cop murder salary, the cop murderer salaries. We get to pay the civil settlements for the cops murdering people, and we get to pay criminal attorneys that are not that are destroying evidence. This this reminds me of the last thing, which I forgot to mention because it's not something that I work on, but I'll pass to you in one second, which is just direct political action in the community to try and replace the leadership. Because hiring and firing... Yeah, they tried that too. Tried that. Hiring and firing the city attorneys is not something that anyone in this room can by themselves do. You have to change the yeah. command structure. I think that we're traveling around there would be no one left. Well, if we discipline the officers, we'll have a department of one. <laughs> if we had enough 911 operators, which is part of the cycle, you call 911 to activate a police officer. It doesn't work anymore. So we have 911, which has become ineffective. They're doing the best that they can. I'm not criticizing them, but six people can't do what 21 people should be doing. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt the meeting. I appreciate everyone's, what everyone has to say, but I just want to be clear on what the purpose of this meeting is and why we are standing here. I stand here representing myself, my family, and all of these impacted families who have had members of their family murdered by Vallejo Police Department. So I'm, I'm going to say this. I've been working on this and working with the ACLU for three years, okay? And I'll say this, there is nobody else standing up here with us, okay? There has not been. And it's not that we are not educated, we don't have knowledge, or we don't know what has happened in our community. It is because no one in any sense of authority has taken the time to listen and find out why the members of our community have been murdered by the police department in the way that they have. So I want to be clear on what the purpose of this community meeting is. Because, yeah, we can sit up all day long and say what the police don't have. But the police don't have that because this is what they have created. They have created this scenario. They have yes. murdered people. Yes. They have deliberately yes. not responded to time because time pays. Hello. Because when you make $200,000 a year in overtime because there are not enough cops, what does that say? That does not sound like public service to me. Nope. We are here because our loved ones have been murdered, because the community is not safe with the people who are supposed to protect us. So while I am aware of the crime in Vallejo, there's a reason why officers don't want to come to Vallejo. There there's is no issue, why there is no issue in Vallejo bigger than the police murdering citizens. To is because they want you to sit here and blame us for the murder that they have committed. But this meeting is not for saying, that. that. This meeting, meeting not for that. This is meeting not for to that. Let people know who are interested that the ACLU is here and has decided to direct resources towards Vallejo. So I think, you know, this is a Find meeting. out the truth about what's going on. They had cops. They had 200 recruits. 
Why aren't they working for the city? Because we have a corrupt police union and a corrupt city government that has kept the recruits from being police officers. Because you don't know the truth. You don't know what's going on. They are still missing because justice is missing. And no, it is not funny. I have stood up here for almost 11 years of my life after my brother was murdered and shot over 30 times, 16 times through the palms of his hands and wrists with his hands up. This is not a secret. You haven't sat in these courtrooms and, and heard how the police actually admit to the things that they're doing. This is not funny. It's really disgusting that you're sitting there laughing when there is blood that has been shed in this city over and over and over again. And you're not doing me any favors by sitting there, so just understand that. Because when you go there and you can't see what's really happening, crime pays. Crime is paid in the city of Vallejo. Who has, who's getting the most? The police. Because they need us to know, hey, you know what? Yeah, we murder people, but you need us. And you know how we're going to make sure you know that? By not responding to your calls. By not investigating Hello. the police. Because don't dare take the time to really focus on what we've been doing, which is murdering people and bending badges, taking human life. Property can always be replaced. So you came here to try to tell us something about what you need. This is what we've been needing. Hello. We need to be able to walk through the streets of the Leo or drive through the streets of the Leo without getting murdered by a police officer. <laughs> that is why I have been working with the ACLU for three years. Now, no, they don't have all the answers, but that is why they are here. Because you know what? For all the negative things that we have been through, all the smiles and disgusting behavior of people who don't care about human life, we are still standing here. And we're going to continue standing here. And we deserve at the least a police department who will protect its citizens and not murder them. This is not a show. You're in the wrong place if you thought this was something else. Because we are here to make the community safer for all the people of Vallejo, not just certain people who live in certain areas, who don't have to worry about being preyed upon when they're sitting in their cars, who don't have to worry about getting beat down or murdered or have a weapon planted on them or raped, sexually assaulted. Educate yourself. And then when you do that, maybe come back. But until then, there's really nothing you can say to just a few of the families who are sitting here suffering. One sitting behind and I you. hope and I pray that you never have to be in this position because it's not a position that I would ever want anybody else to be in. I used to be lightweight ignorant. I was aware that things happened, but I did not realize they were happening right in front of me because the police controlled the media. They controlled the newspapers. They controlled the district attorney. And with that said, I will end on this. Now, I know that this is not perfect. But we're not coming here with perfection. We're coming here with a group of people who are here to listen and see what we can do. Not what we can't do. Because we've tried everything. And who else is standing here with us? Who else is pledging resources and things that we need? Because we haven't given up. And it is very frustrating when we hear things that are going into law that don't apply to our corrupt police department. So because we know they don't follow any type of rule or law, and we've seen it over and over and over and over again, this isn't hearsay, this isn't gossip, this is facts. It's facts. So with them being here, if we could look within ourselves and start with one thought, 
what can they help us with? Because if it's impossible and it's nothing that we can do, then why are we here? Now, we, we're I here because... I that spoke tonight, that spoke here, was speaking from the heart. And they, they gave you guys something that you could walk away with, the frustration, the chaos that you have to bring order to if you want to make a change with this law. This is, these are some things that have to be worked out. There's a lot of murders that have happened in Vallejo, California, by police officers to unarmed black and brown men. And there's a lot of things that happens with families. They tear apart. People, people are not only torn apart by their families, but family members have to leave the city and leave the state for protection purposes. And when I'm listening to you guys and you're saying, oh, well, we haven't heard about that. We have to go back and check that one out or whatever. It's a, it's a, it sets off a, a light bulb in my head because I have three family members who have been attacked by this force. I've been threatened by them in front of our attorneys where they asked me my name and told me, yeah, we'll be safe out there after you murdered my cousin because I know what you did. I was the first one that knew about the bad minute. Don't nobody know that. I said it the first day, February 19th, they were doing an initiation for police gang. And they, they killed them by firing squad. And not too long after that, I was going to work at 3 o'clock in the morning, and five highway patrols pulled me over and surrounded my car to tell me that my tags were going to be due in the next six months. I told them, uh, well, they said, do you need my driver's license for registration? They said, no, David, we know who you are. We know where you live, and we know where you work. Wow. These are the gangs that they play. They go to people's houses, shine their lights on there, and to their house, and to their windows and stuff. So once you guys come with this stuff and you sit down and see what the citizenry is up against, we need resources for protection. Like that woman said, we call in the police and the police ain't coming, they ain't responding. They're doing an illegal shutdown of work because they're saying, yeah, y'all keep talking about uh, what we doing, we'll make it hard on you. We'll let everybody break in your house and do this, this, that, and the other. So what I say to you is, it don't matter about a costume. I'm an actor, I know about acting. Everybody wears a costume, I don't mean you that person. So if I put on a police uniform and I go rob somebody, I'm gonna go to jail, right? Because I'm impersonating a police officer. Well, I'm saying to you now, these officers that have been inducted into the Vallejo Police Department are perpetrating to be police officers and they're really criminals. We're dealing with an ongoing criminal conspiracy uh, enterprise that's going on in Vallejo from the top because everybody knows about badge bending. Cops have told on other cops where they got their badge bent, who did it, and who's to, where it started from. We know all of this stuff, right? But why is our district attorney saying we don't investigate rumors? This is what we up against. So when we come in here and we say, oh yeah, we got a whole bunch of police officers on the thing that are gonna be on this board to oversee this thing and this, that, and the other. Well, you got people in here that's looking at that saying, hey, this is not even an option for us. Our lives are on the line. This ain't just about the law. We want some, we, and then you say, oh, well, it's not gonna, it's got a statute of limitations on it, so you can't really go back, but there's no statute of limitations on murder for a, a citizen. Mm -hmm. A citizen, if you kill somebody, I don't care if it's 1923, you can go to jail. And we know that police officers, the things they do, just like the, the Golden Gate killer. He was a serial killer, but he was a police officer. You got police officers who have raped women on duty and done things, so we know that they do this. They're human beings wearing a uniform. And what I say to the lady in the back, get your gun, get your dog, stop kicking the man out the house, let somebody, because we, we at war. This is a war for us. This is not something that we just come into a meeting and having some pizza and, sh and stuff like that. This is not what this is. This is people saying, we, we, you know, these officers are still out here and they're not in handcuffs. And even though you might put them off with pay for a day or even without pay, they're out here still lurking around and there's potential victims who they want to get out the way because they're talking too much because it's been done already. They kill other people for witnessing a murder and other police officers, evidence of all of this. And the overkill, 30 shots, 55 shots, who does that? Who, get, who shoots a sleeping man 55 times? That should have shot up a red flag right then. And then the news saying, oh yeah, uh, well, it was a 22 year old rapper with a, had a Taco Bell sleep with a gun on his lap. Who believes that? When Taco Bell called Where's the gun? You see what I'm saying? They, and then, but, but you go along with that, but we have to say, say alleged. But they don't say alleged. They put their story up out there, and then the next thing you know, the world runs with it. 
And then we, we sit here with the ACLU, we think and we all hopeful that you guys have the answers. I know you don't have the answers because we've been at war for too long. There's families that have been fighting for 11 years to get justice and they know what happened to their family. The people have talked about it, okay? So I'm hoping that this program that you guys put in effect involves some type of handcuffs on some police officers or involves some type of protection for people inside the city of Vallejo because they're unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, Lillian McCoy, Brother Corey wanted me to speak on something that's been brought to my attention recently that I think is something you guys might be able to help with. Um, people are concerned about the fact that we don't have police officers and that's, 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 a, real, that's a real situation. Um, I know that when I started advocating for this family, um, I didn't really have any idea of what was going on, like a lot of community members don't. Um, and I got a, my rude awakening is when I was getting death threats and they said they were gonna gut me in front of my children. Um, so I have a bit of a different uh, view of some of these things and some of these folks do. I, I'm far, you know, I, I, I bought an AR-15, not because I'm scared of the community members that might break into my house, but I'm scared that these, men, that these men might come and actually gut me that now that we're exposing things, but we have to. We have to make the decisions to do the right thing. One of the things that you guys can help with is potentially getting, um, getting the city to comply with post, post qualifications for police officers. It's been brought to my attention and would be part of the litigation that they have been historically hiring people that did not pass the civil service exam, did not pass the background exam, did not, were not able to pass the physical. They were recruiting white supremacists, violent people, people who could not pass background checks. The state law requires certain, certain qualifications before you can be a police officer. I was a police officer. I had to do all of these things. But these folks here have not had to do the things. And when we see what's happened in the community with some of these people, we understand how some of these things happen because now we know that the recruitment has been controlled completely by the police department. They will not let HR, the Human Resources Department, has not been participating. So these are things where that type of oversight, something where you guys could push on that, would be huge for actually potentially bringing in officers who we didn't have to be terrified of, that we didn't have to you know, be concerned we're actually going to murder people and would actually potentially come because of. But part of the recruitment problem right this very day is because when Chief Williams was bringing in diverse, qualified applicants, they were, they were harassing them, they were threatening, they were forced out, they forced Williams out, and they will not hire right now because they don't want to have to hire according to what post requires. And these are things that will come out. The people that were involved in the processes have spoken on it. There are multiple whistleblowers because they want people to really understand why we're in this situation. We've got a blue flu going on. We've got a lot of people that have been on indefinite leave, people that were investigated for misconduct, cleared, and have just been sitting on our tax dollars for years and years. And so the recruitment part, part I think that's something that you guys might be able to, to help with ensuring that they actually get the post-certified officers. There should be some something in place, whether it's through litigation that you guys could do, to ensure that there's some third party checking the verifications, because there are third party companies that you can do all of the certifications through. The level won't allow them to do that. They require it all to be in-house so that these really, really horrible people are, are, are controlling that. So when folks are concerned about the, those kind of concerns about police not coming, they need to understand that it's bigger than than not than budget, it's, it's, it's much bigger, it's, it's part of the systemic problem. So that would be something that I think that you guys might be able to, to help with. It's something that I'm continuing to, starting to speak on now. I've let the DOJ know about, I've let the FBI, because we're concerned, we, we've let the city know that I know, and now it creates further, further fear for us because now we're exposing things that, that they were wanting to not, could not let us know about the murders, but really what was underneath that is the people that they were bringing in that created these circumstances. So I just want to make sure you guys were aware that that was going on because I think that's a place where you guys could, could be some of that funding. You guys have the resources to, to direct specific things that have been that have been um, identified. So that's I just want to speak on that. Yeah, I want to know what the time scale for this whole process is supposed to be. Like, if you file a complaint right now, how long is it supposed to at what point is the, well, like, if the process goes without a hitch, how long is it going to take for there to be a decertification? Like a month, a week, a year? 
10 years. <laughs> this is a question. So I know right now the first hearing is potentially going to happen in October. And the list of the certification officers um, started being posted early this year. So around February. So that's March, April, May, June, July, <coughs> August, September, October. So I know for at least it took eight months from the time that an officer got their name posted on the certification list. Now we have to remember this is a new process. Mm -hmm. So I have nothing to base it off of before. So just simply based on what I've seen so far, there is no exact timeline. Is the certification list public? Yes. Yeah. Oh. So the long story is, the long story short, there is no exact timeline. Okay. So hopefully this process becomes quicker as those involved get more experience with it and it becomes more of a routine thing. That's, that's, that's the hope. I, I don't want to say you're making promises, but that's the hope. Okay. And it's just a logical deduction. Okay. Uh, I'll come to you right now. I'll go over there. So for... Um, so you guys touched a little bit about the consent decree that right now you're kind of out of the loop in regards to it. So the big thing right now that we're getting from city management and from council is basically there's no funding, right? So like a background, Oakland spends one to four million dollars per year on their commission, right? So that might not be sustainable for the city of Vallejo. So my question is, are you able to talk with the DOJ to have a, a more significant consent decree passed, but do you guys have a lobbyist arm to be able to reach some of our legislators to be able to provide some funding? Because the reality is, if Vallejo can't, you know, they're gonna resist as long as they can because they can't take that financial hit. So the big thing is we need funding in order to be able to process a more significant consent decree. And right now it's gonna be resisted from the city up until that point, so. They don't have to do it. So they're like, we're going to keep the pressure on. You don't have no choice. You're going to have to pay for it. Correct. But the, 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 they're ready to pay $30 million for a police station. So you ain't gonna get why they ain't going to pay a million dollars to that? Because uh, all that doesn't matter. Right. Wait, can I ask we you don't, we don't pay the monitor. All right. right. I'll say it out loud. I know you don't have your mic on your mouth. You're saying if there's a consent decree passed, who's going to monitor that consent decree and report to DOJ because is DOJ going to be on the ground investigating itself to make sure there's compliance? Is that what you're asking? Well, who's going to, so the city's going to continue resisting any significant change without any funding. So we, we need some, we need legislators or assembly people to step up and say, the state of California is going to provide you with five years worth of money to be able to have a significant reform policy passed, right? So if we don't have any money, the city's going to keep resisting. But if we have funding from the state, then we can push for a more significant The money's period. been being embezzled by the city officials and city workers for years. Wake up. What, what I, would, I can answer the first part, sort of, and the second part, not very well at all, but I will try. The first part is, I don't know why DOJ is listening, but they are listening. There are some folks in the community who are having conversations with them. That's a positive sign. We interpret that as a sign that we could get their ear to. My suspicion is they don't want to put in place a consent decree and then face blowback from the community that it actually didn't do anything and that they're not in the right either. So they want the community on their side and they want to get a sense of what's going to pass. They want the community on their side at the helm of a, 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 a board that only can make a recommendation. You're not putting no hard, no, no facts on the line saying, okay, if you do X, Y, and Z, this is what will happen to you. We don't have any of that that deals with a police officer. Now, now listen, if the law don't apply to everybody, it don't apply to nobody. So you can't, you can't expect that these police officers that have been breaking the law, city council members and people in high offices in city, in city government are supposed to uphold a law that's going to Finger police officer. You think that's going to happen? I'm not sure what we're talking about. If we're talking about SB2, I don't know. So that, that has, uh, we have some more comments around here, so yeah, we'll, let's go. we'll, we'll continue here. 
Um, I'm not sure what you guys can do to even answer the question, but we're currently under an emergency decree. Nobody can explain what that means. The last time we were under an emergency, emergency decree, we had military and armor here on the streets. We went into curfew. There were a lot of things that were going on. And so it hasn't really been discussed in the city about what that emergency decree means and what the level of authority that presents to the police department. So one of the things that they're talking about is bringing in possibly the sheriff's department. I'm not clear I want the sheriff department. <laughs> because the last time the sheriff department came and backed up the police department, they shot a right. mentally ill man who had a, a saw blade in his hand. And so there's no regulation over the sheriff department by our police department. So how are our policies aligned? What is the use of force? What is the de-escalation process? All of that stuff has to be discussed because do they follow our rules or do they follow the sheriff's rules? And so we're bringing in maybe a potential of a bigger problem. The other part of that is it's been identified that there are people who belong to the sheriff department that are part of this fringe organization. I think three percenters is the name. And the sheriff lied and said that the FBI had investigated and that there were no problems with them being in, in the, within, within the department. And then the FBI comes back and says, we didn't do an investigation. So I'm not sure I want the sheriff department to come a, our police department, if that's the case, without having some kind of discussion in the forefront about whose policy, who's going to follow, and that if they're doing it according to the police department, who's got oversight by the DOJ, that's one thing. But if the sheriff department can do whatever they want to, and then go back to Fairfield, and they have no repercussion in this community, I'm not sure that that is something that we want as well. So that discussion has to be made, and it needs to be made in the public, and not just between the police department, the city manager, and the sheriff department. And so that emergency decree is something I think we need to flesh out for the community to understand what exactly is their power by having this emergency, and what does it mean to us. And the sheriff's department has already said no. They don't want nothing to do with the they're, they're, they don't want to send their employees here because of the liability that exists because of the current command staff. So we're going to have to get CHP in, and it's $110 an hour. But if that's what it takes, then they just need to spend the money. So I want to thank um, Andrea and Chris for organizing this meeting tonight, and all of you who are here from the ACLU. We, we need help, we need expertise, and a lot of it's been provided on the lawsuit involving uh, the Giordano badge tip bending report on the talks that are going on with the Department of Justice. We've received a very valuable background memo comparing uh, consent decrees all over the country and all, all everything that's been provided by the ACLU has been passed through the Department of Justice and it's time to become more directly involved in, in talks with, with them. So thank, thank you for expressing interest in that. Our city has tried to ignore this culture of police violence for decades. It's a bill that we have to pay now. The state isn't going to pay it. There's no foundation that's going to say, here's a million dollars. We have to pay for what has happened here. And, and it's, it's, it's ugly. Measure P is money that can be used because it's general fund tax money that we all thought might be used primarily for roads and other things that are nice and long, long overdue, but it can be used for any um, expense of the city. And this is expense that we have incurred, our leaders, our police officials, city managers, and now we have to pay for, for our, our catastrophic um, you know, history and, and, and murders. We have to pay today. We can't ask anybody else to help us because they're going to look at us and say, in 2018, you got kicked out of a municipal insurance pool, the same size as cities, the same size of Vallejo, who said, we're not going to keep covering your costs. You haven't changed. We've warned you year after year. You have to clean up your police department. And we did nothing. It just got worse and worse and worse. So we can't point to anything and say, you really have to bail us out, you know. 
We've known about these things for decades. Today, these new stories about police uh, murders using tasers and uh, other violence that had never been shared with me. But then, of course, Liad, who's been involved in city government for decades, she knew about some of these cases. And 20 years ago, they tried to pressure the city into taking action, and nothing happened. So this is our debt, and we have to suck it up. And it's shocking, it's sickening, but we have to face it. And I know, Chris, you've been facing it for over a decade, and all of you who are here tonight to help on this, thank you, because it's only together that we can make progress. We need help on a charter revision. We cannot, we cannot fire police officers under our current city charter. That's not subject to any dispute. I'm a retired city attorney. It's what city attorneys across the state believe about the, the, the charters as old as ours. We can't afford to litigate it. We've got to get a charter revision to expand the power of the police commission. We have, we, we, but there are many areas that you've identified, Avi, that need improvement and the common ground and others who worked on the ordinance know are imperfections that should be corrected and can be without a charter revision. So we need, we need, we do need help on that. What Melissa just outlined, and then the, I'll, I'll stop. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm monopolizing so much time. It now appears, due to information that has come from, from a whistleblower who has courage and who has stood up, the, the, our police department was receiving applications from women LGBTQ applicants and people of color and not processing those applicants because they didn't want them in the Vallejo Police. They didn't communicate to them and say, well, you don't meet the minimum um, uh, post qualifications or the interviews are on such and such a date. They just ignored that they had applied. And this, this needs um, legal action. I mean, and so when we talk about how we don't have enough police officers, had we been lawfully recruiting and screening applicants, had we not fired the police recruiters the, the day that the Chief Williams resigned, we would be making progress, but we have restored the culture that recruited badge tip vendors and people who keep their mouths shut about it. And so we, we, we need help. We've got to expose all of this. Uh, my name is J.D. Miller. Uh, many people in the city of Vallejo recognize me as being the fiscal conscience of the city of Vallejo. Uh, there have been a lot, a lot of things, uh, a number of things that were suggested, uh, but you had just suggested right here. Uh, I'd like to strongly emphasize this is a problem that needs to be fixed in Vallejo. You don't go outside of the city of Vallejo to try to get help because the, the bottom line is it's not a fiscal problem. It's not that the money's not there. It's how they choose to spend the money. I've been, I've been preaching this, this message to the city of Vallejo since 2013. You go back and you watch a, a, a lot of the uh, budget uh, presentations there. Uh, I haven't been there for quite a few years. But, uh, year after year after year, I said, take a look at your own numbers right there. What they do is they tell you the way you're spending your money, you're going you're gonna to put yourself into bankruptcy again. I mean, we told them that we, back in 2013, Citizens Budget Advisory Committee told the city council, if you keep doing what you're doing, you can end up in bankruptcy. Well, one of the things that the citizens of the community stepped up with the, the strong effort of a lot of people that care about the city of Leo was they got binding arbitration out of the city charter. Yes. It took four times for the citizens to bring it up. They, they passed by 514 votes. Yep. It only worked because the citizens of Vallejo decided that they were going to make a change. We don't need you to go and lobby the state of California to get us more money here. The money is here. They have, we have to decide that this is what we want the money to be spent on. And the only way we're going to get a change in the culture of the police department is when we decide we want it. We got binding arbitration out of their contract because they were, they've been running the city. They and the fire department have been running the city and spending our money for decades after, the, what was it, 1965, I think whenever the police strike was. And binding arbitration went into the charter a couple years later because we didn't want another police strike. We didn't want another firefighter strike. Terrified the citizens of Leo. It's five days, what it was. But pe people got terrified. It took us until 
when was it, 2017, when, when we got rid of buying arbitration? Somewhere back then. But anyway, anyway, the bottom line is, you don't need help from Sacramento or anybody else. It can all be done in this community right here. The money is here, you just have to tell the city council you want the money spent on, you can produce the result and what you want. And I think this is something else I preach to this, the city council. They should be there and the, and the people who work for the city should be there to create a community where it's a great place for kids to grow up, where people can get old here, enjoy their lives. They never have to worry about where they go in the city of Vallejo because they're safe in their homes, their community, and that's it. say one thing I this whole time I've been listening and thinking and you know having met Chris and worked with her the past few years and, and work with these folks um, I didn't think it was possible for me to have such a warm feeling of having so many wonderful people that I respect so much in a room and also feel so heartbroken at the same time and my ask of the group here would be that we remember that hopefully that we are all on the same team in this and the thing that the, the powers that we have tried to do for the past decades is drive a wedge. Yeah. They have tried to convince us that if we listen to the people in the front row who I hope no one ever has to go through what, what these folks have gone through, if we listen to them, we're not going to be safe. Nobody's safe unless everybody's safe. And we are strongest when we are all together. We might not agree on every single nuance of every single thing, but these folks, I, I just, I can't live in a city where families get treated the way that these families have gotten treated. I don't have to experience it, and I don't have to feel it, and I don't have to understand it, right? I just have to stand with them. And so my allies in the room, we have such a wonderful group here that has like impact families to allies to council members. I would ask everyone to please just stand with folks in this room and remember we are on the same team. We all want to be safe in our community. We're in a crisis. We're not going to get out of it. It's not going to be easy. And I like the ACLU is here to help and be in this big tent with us. So that's just that's my that's my comment to you all. I'm so appreciative of everybody here. I just wanted to say that um, you know we are in a crisis and everything these gentlemen and everybody has been saying Melissa you know Corey every everybody's been saying it's it's so true um, the problem is here in Vallejo the problem needs to be addressed here in Vallejo we need to quit letting everybody sweep Vallejo under the rug and all the things that have happened here in Vallejo under the rug for 21 more years um, I may have weird and not, you know, the typical idea of what we could do, but aren't we all in agreement that we need police reform? Well, why can't Vallejo be the poster child for, for police reform? Because if it's happened in Antioch, it's happened in Vallejo. If it's happened in Anaheim, it's happened in Vallejo. If it's happened in Uvalde, it's happened in Vallejo. If, if it's happened anywhere, it's happened in Vallejo, and it's continuing to happen in Vallejo. And all these cities, Antioch needs their help. Yes, they sure do. What about us? We have racist cops. We have cops that are doing the text messaging and ruling out and pushing out our police chief who is trying to do something more than nothing. What about ACLU? Maybe we could work together on creating the political force that needs to make Vallejo the poster child for police reform. Because if it's happened anywhere, you can bet there's a list of it happening here. Anything on any city, on any list, that's happened to any citizen, any, whatever, whatever you want to call it, whether it's, whether it's the impacted families, whether it's, um, you know, um, profiling people when they're pulling them over, the whole gambit. It's happened here. We have it here. So maybe we should work together on making Vallejo the real, the police uh, reform uh, city for the United States. 
because if it's happened anywhere, it's happened here, and it continues to happen here. Do you know 60 Minutes came here a long, long time ago and did a story on Vallejo? Yeah. You know, and a lot of people, when, I, when they say, oh, really, it happens? I go, yeah, maybe you should go on YouTube and check out that 60 Minutes, because sometimes people don't believe it unless they see it in the media. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the things, like all these impacted families know, the police force twist the narrative. They twist it, they make it what they want it to be, they, they victimize the victim after they're gone for everybody to say, well, you know, it's really too bad, but maybe they kind of deserved it. No, they didn't deserve it. No, Willie did not deserve to, he deserved to go home. He was hungry. He stopped by Taco Bell to get dinner, not to die. You know, Ronald Foster should not have been pulled aside for riding a bike without a light. Angel should have been able to have an argument with someone in his home over something and go to sleep that night. And his mom should have been up with seeing him that morning, not in the morgue. I, I, I'm new to this fight, but I'm not gonna shut up. I write about this fight. I will continue to write about this fight. I will continue to talk about this fight. And I am not intimidated. I cannot be intimidated. My friends, my, my, my children are afraid for me because they keep saying, you know, you know, mom, they may not come after you, but what if they come after us? And that's the only fear I have. But I can just tell you right now, these families, these impacted families, all these families you see that are here, that aren't here, that are around the country, that are in Vallejo, many, many, many of them in Vallejo, they're stronger than anyone I've ever met because they're coming at this full force. 11 plus years, they're coming at this full force nonviolently. I don't know anyone else that would do that. I, I can't say honestly if they killed my child, I could be here nonviolently, and I'll admit it. So, you know, maybe we could make Vallejo the poster child for police reform, because it's needed all across the country. And, you know, everybody wanted to ignore us, so maybe we could make the loudest roar right there. Yeah. Thank you. We'll take, we'll take two more comments, and uh, we're, we're getting close to that. Hey there. Um, everybody, my name is Ace, and I wanted to introduce myself because clearly this is a room of people who care about the community and change by the community for the community is very important. Uh, me and my friends work for this organization, Voices of VV, and soon we're going to be releasing a petition to defund the police. And I know that defunding the police is a song and dance that we've heard before, but it's like we'll be damned if we don't try. Um, and if you want to come down to the waterfront next Friday, We'll have a petition for you to sign to hopefully defund the police to bring to our city council. But the city does have the money. I mean, he said earlier, the city has money, but we're paying all our taxpayer money to fund the police. And that, that ain't right. What, like 50% of the city budget? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. It is crazy. And I know that it might seem like a long shot, but like, damn, we gotta try. Um, so, yeah, next Friday, what, 420 to about 620 will be out there if you want to come out. Um, we also do that mural of all the victims of the Babel 14, that chalk mural at the waterfront. Um, you know, we don't bite. Uh, feel free to come and say hello, and thank you for coming out tonight. Yeah, you're good. Three, two more. We'll take that one, and that one will be done. Just wanted to add on to something that Bridget was speaking about when she brought up the Antioch Police Department and some of the comparisons. The difference is, in the city of Vallejo, we have a complicit city attorney's office, a complicit district attorney. In the city of Antioch, they have a mayor, a chief of police, and a city attorney that were not with that shit. But see, the difference is in Vallejo, it's all one big ring. Right. 
It has been for the longest time, and we know the players. And so some of the new booties want to act like the things that have been going on for decades haven't been going on, and we can start from scratch. You can't start fresh without addressing all the fuck shit that's been going on for decades, and all the different players, people, city officials, people that have been pilfering and pillaging off of the community in the city, and then we have the audacity and the nerve to be like, well, where are we going to get the money from? Uh -uh. I just want you all to know I am living hell because of the city council and what's been going on, and I'm going to fight to the end. And I will let the crowd know. It's been spread around that I'm gravely mentally ill. I am absolutely not, and I don't appreciate anybody saying you're crazy or anything else. I'm very alert, I've observed a lot of things, and I'm gonna shout out. And I want you to know I don't want anybody to be, just be, you do it the right way. I don't want anybody to react badly. And these families have done a great job of that. But it's real. The city has a problem, and it's way beyond. It's not at the police level; it's political. So I just want you to know the families have suffered, and I'm living hell now, and I have to make big decisions. But I'm not being quiet. I've been quiet, but it's going to be out there now. Thank you. I just want to say that I'm, I'm, I'm really filled with a lot of hope, and I feel uh, very grateful that you're here. You're one part of a large number of actions that have to happen. A lot of the families are doing their other things too that are appropriate. And they're not going to shut up, and I'm really proud of all the people who are there who take it. I mean, they get a lot of a lot of bad flack. I mean, I, I did one little political thing years ago, and I started getting lots of life insurance offers in my in my phone. You ever seen those? They, they were coming really frequently because I was buying at Orson, a cement plant. Woo! You know, and all of a sudden I'm getting that kind of stuff from people. But it was weird. But um, for all the trauma that's in the room, you guys are handling us really delicately and gently and kindly and really humanely. And I don't see that anywhere. I don't see it in the school board. I don't see it uh, when I have had a complaint to the police, which I don't call them anymore. Period. Yeah. I got a guy down the street with a bunch of AR-15s. I'm not sure if we're safer or more dangerous because they haven't got PTSD. But my point about that is that our neighbors, we take care of each other a lot. Because yeah. we've had to, right? Yeah. Even when there's gunfire in the neighborhood, if there are kids out of my neighborhood, I stop fights with 100 kids by myself. That can sound bigger than I am. You know, so we have a community that really cares about each other. And I hope that they understand enough about each other that they need to understand each other more. I've seen some really willfully ignorant people in the room talk about how we just need this, we just need that. It's always like the police are the answer. But you know what they are? The secretary with guns. They come after the fact most of the time. I can take a report. I was one of the first people on the org chart at Burning Man. I ran three counties of EMS myself at night. I didn't carry a gun. I stopped riots. We had to call the ATF when there was an actual bomb, because it was out of my purview, the dispatch lead, right? But I'm telling you, a lot of stuff can be done to make our community safer without guns without violence. People know you're coming to help them. And we don't have those guys in uniform. And I'll tell you why. It's because of exactly what people over here have said as well. Because I don't want to work next to a guy who's a psychopathic killer, a guy who's bent a badge. I'm not going to do that. You know, it's dangerous to disparage a guy publicly, but here I am. You know, I'm a father. I'm concerned about my child. Once at a protest years ago, the fire and police protest they had, I was out front and one of the guys said, Fuck you, my language the kids in the room. The yeah, F-bomb is real, okay? <laughs> Fuck you, TJ, I'll kick your ass. The first thing I go, whoa, where'd that come from? I'm protesting these okay? Another guy says, do you have any kids? I said, yes, I do. Oh, well, how many? I go, one. Boy or girl? Girl. Then he says to me, well, how old is she? And she's like three years old. You know, she could catch a bullet. What the fuck? See, so you think I'm not upset? So I took that to Sacramento with some of these folks when they were working on some legislation. And I told that story out loud. It made me cry just telling it. Very difficult. I can't imagine losing a loved one to this. 
I'm very sorry for all the families who've lost loved ones to this. And you guys, your patience is, I, I can't thank you enough for your patience with all of us, because we're all in trauma, we're all hurting. You can't watch those videos and not be completely distorted and add up to that, nightmares or whatever. I've seen a lot of stuff, because I trained with the PD in Napa, I've seen people decapitated before in photographs of the sheriff's department, right? So I've seen a lot of stuff, but after watching the brutalization of Ronell Foster, that blew my mind. If any of you can handle watching something like that, and then speaking to the family members who's on the fence about how many cops we need, okay? Do it. That will change your mind. You need to think about it. Because you don't need violent people to come to you when you need help all the time. And also, this guy, Officer Todd, I'll say his name out loud, okay? He went on the amygdala. They call it the amygdala effect, which just shuts down, and you no longer have good judgment. If you're in the back of a vehicle, and you point a guy at a guy, you put a gun at a guy to shoot him with an imaginary gun. He had an imaginary gun. Isn't that amazing? You can't get rid of that guy. A constitutional violation. Same thing would happen in South America. It happened in El Salvador. I met little kids who were on the run, their families on the run, from police officers in El Salvador who said they, they shot the dog. Friends, one little kid. They said, if you don't leave in 20 minutes, we're going to come back and take your house and start shooting the kids. Okay? They're shooting our kids here. Those are, that's an organized crime, okay? If we, let, if we let that go, if the citizens of Atlanta let that go, we have no morals. You know, we need to start grabbing each other's hands. If we don't understand something, ask a question. And then we gotta come up with solutions and, and help the ACLU partner with them in our trauma, whatever it looks like. I hope they can handle this more. But, you know, we, we really do appreciate it. We need to make sure that every police officer mandatorily has to have his, his camera on. And maybe even a third party nonprofit watches the footage and makes determinations of whether or not they were, their use of force was outside of the policy. Right? We need to have that kind of hands off from the police. Whenever money gets put into the budget, and I think this emergency thing is part of that. I think that they're trying to get a little something extra going again. But if guys are making two or three hundred thousand dollars a year while people around here are struggling and then, you know, have loved ones that are dead. I think it's a really disgusting situation we're in. This, it's definitely spread throughout our country, it's not just here, but Vallejo definitely needs more attention to it. So thank you to the ACLU for showing up, and please take our suggestions and work with us, and keep your patience because you're gonna need it for us. But we love you, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So before, uh, before we close, uh, and I pass it to Andrea or Chris, um, we want to thank you all for, for sharing your pain with us. We don't take that lightly. Uh, we know that it took a lot for, for you all to be here, but for you all to share the pain, the trauma, the suffering that you're going, not, not only that you have gone through, especially for those of you who've lost loved ones, but for the ongoing pain and terror that a lot of you are going through. Right? We appreciate you sharing that with us. And we don't take that lightly. It's something we're going to take. The other thing, we want to reiterate as a, as a team, as an organization, is that we're here, and we're here to stay, right? Our commitment to all of you is that we're going to be here for the foreseeable future, walking alongside you, fighting the good fight. We may not always win. We're not always going to have the answers. There are going to be times where we're going to be wrong about stuff, and you're going to correct us. There are going to be times where we're going to have to have a discussion about what we think is the best path forward. Uh, we'll do our best to follow your lead and to be here and to walk with you and, and, and all the way to that. So this is going to be the first of many future meetings and the first of many future collaborations across different buckets of work. We'll, once we go back and we kind of process in terms of what are the concrete areas where we can start working on immediately, what are going to be the areas where maybe we're not going to we're gonna work on three things this year, but maybe like the next five things next year. We're gonna work with you all to figure out what those things are, and then work with whoever is gonna work with us to advance those goals across whatever buckets we collectively decide. But the minimum requirement, the minimum commitment that we're all making here is that we are here, we are here to stay, we're gonna walk with you all the way. So thank you all so much for coming for sharing everything that you've shared with us. Please take, there's a lot of food left, so.
take food and, and uh, don't leave anything here. Um, if there's a sign-on sheet that was circling around, so that's the best way for us to get a hold of you. Uh, you have our cards here, come take our cards from us, and then uh, if there's anything my colleagues would like to add before we close. Right. Andrea, Chris, you want to close us up? Just thank you. Yeah, we're, you know, we're over. We want to thank you all. Many of you know how to get a hold of one or both of us. If you aren't already on the email list for the Solano County chapter, ACLU chapter, please find one of us or send an email to ACLU Solano at gmail.com. If you filled out the registration form, well, we can get you, we can get a hold of you that way and send you the invite. And if we welcome folks to be part of these ongoing discussions. If you'd like to be part of it, we need all hands on deck. We can also keep you updated um, as we move forward with these folks. Um, so please get involved if you aren't already. I just want to say thank you again, everybody who came out. Um, we're all in this together. You know, we're going through things, and we also know that you know other people who may not be going through the loss of a loved one, you're going through things too. And we do want you to know that we do care. You know, one thing that this has not done to us is it has not taken away our humanity. Uh, so we just want to thank you again, and, and we hope to see you again. Thank you.